Uh, okay, so uh, hello everybody. Welcome to this second meeting of GM seminars. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jacopo Livelli from University Sapienza of Rome. And he is going to give a talk about convergence properties of symmetrization processes. Uh, Jacopo, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks to the organizer. Thank everybody for being here. Uh, today, I will try to introduce you to the unusual topic of uh, symmetrizations. Indeed, symmetrizations are actually quite old. Uh, it's a technique which was introduced in the second half of the 19th century by Jacob Steiner in order to prove the isoperimetric inequality. But after that, many uh, different applications, always with inequalities, this is an instrument mainly uh, employed to prove uh, geometric and functional inequalities. Uh, I will try to show you a sort of survey of what symmetrizations are and the, a new approach to symmetrization, which is quite recent, uh, which treats these objects not only as instruments, but as an uh, item of research of its own. So if this is not a difficult topic, but it's unusual. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to stop me and I'd be more than glad to answer your doubts. So let's start with a bit of notations and conventions. Uh, we will work mainly uh, with the compact sets and compact convex sets in our N and use the term body to refer to objects with a positive measure. And the letter C and K uh, will mean the family of compact sets and compact convex sets respectively. The subscripts here are just notations, but we don't use we, we, we won't use them much. This is just the first slide I used for every talk, and I didn't remember to cut the extra part. So we have these objects. We will use a symmetrizations on these objects, and we will see how the measures of these objects interact with symmetrization. In particular, uh, we study the volume. B, the surface S, and this other object here. But before uh, looking at the formulas, uh, let's see this image. So this is something that can be done uh, for convex sets. And when we have convex sets, we can define a support function, which is the last line on this page. But don't bother with the analytic meaning. Let's go to the geometric meaning. So uh, the, the, the peculiarity of convex sets is that uh, the the normal image on the surface is always well defined. So for every point, maybe it's not only one normal vector, but for, for every point, we have normal vectors, uh, maybe a subset of the sphere. And uh, we cover all the spheres with the normal vectors of uh, to the surface of uh, convex sets. So we fix a direction, in this case, u. And if we, if we, if we can find a oriented hyperplane, uh, with u as normal, and we can do the same for the opposite of u. So we have these two hyperplanes. Uh, the support function is the distance from the origin of these planes. Here you see we have, you have hk of u and minus hk of minus u. This is just because the distance here it's negative is considered as negative because it's of the because of the, the orientation. But what we need here is just actually the width, uh, which is uh, the addition of uh, the support function into opposite direction, which in practice is just the distance between uh, uh, the two hyperplanes, put it such that uh, the ob this is a, a sandwich, the hyperplanes are the bread, and the object in the middle is the rest. So this distance here is the width in a certain direction. And if we consider the integral, and they then take the mean, this is the mean width. This is a quantity together with volume and surface. Uh, these are called intrinsic volumes. Uh, there are even other intrinsic volumes uh, which can be categorized with respect to the degree of homogeneity. And it's the, uh, the degree n is the volume, n minus one is the surface. There is a lot of stuff in the middle. Degree one is the uh, uh, mean width. And actually there is even the degree zero, which is the Euler characteristic. But we, we won't talk about that here. So uh, the, the last thing about support function I want to say is that uh, uh, this is a known fact, but maybe not of, not of you have studied some of this convexity. There is a bijection between the convex compact sets of Rn 
and support functions. Support functions are uh, one homogeneous convex function. So these two families are actually interchangeable. And uh, we will see some property, very good properties when uh, we go to the family of convex sets because convexity very often is not only a geometric uh, uh, constraint, but even an algebraic constraint. So uh, an operation we will use in this family of sets, both compact, convex, but it can be used even in wider settings, but we will stay here, is the Minkowski sum or addition, which basically we take two sets and two sets and the, all, all the possible sum of vectors taken as couples from one of the from the first and the second element of uh, element of the addition. And you, you see in, in the image what uh, Minkowski addition can give. Uh, maybe the ones more familiar with, uh, uh, for example, mean curvature flows. I've seen this when uh, the addition is with a ball. In this case, if we put a ball instead of a triangle, uh, we will see a smoothed square, for example. It's just uh, another way to, of picturing it for convex sets is just sliding uh, one of the, two, of the two objects on the boundary of the other, exactly as you see here in the picture. And there is a very important property for Minkowski addition with the uh, support functions, uh, which we have this commutativity. So the uh, addition of two support functions of two respective bodies. So these two, these two functions here are univocally determined by the respective bodies K and L. Uh, the addition of, the, of these two support function is equal to the support function of the Minkowski addition. This is quite useful very often. So this uh, is a... Uh, uh, a very important property. And last thing, topologically speaking, uh, these, these spaces, both compact sets and compact convex sets, which is closed in the same family of compact sets, uh, are topology are, met, are complete metric spaces with this distance. This is known as Blaschke selection theorem. So when we use uh, uh, sequences, we can use the classic tools uh, of analysis to analyze them. Uh, last preliminary observation is the Bruminkowski inequality, which we will use a lot. And actually, this is a, this is a very this is inequality is so important. There is a whole book about it. If you're interested, is this one here, uh, convex body the Bruminkowski theory. Uh, but we will use it because this inequality gives us uh, in practice. This says that uh, the one over mp power of the volume is super linear with respect to the Minkowski addition. So basically, this tells us how the volume increases with uh, uh, the Minkowski addition of two sets. There are even some uh, equality conditions. We don't; they are quite technical, even though uh, they are useful. But this inequality here, we will use it. It's very important. We have this monotonicity. Okay. So, any questions with the the these first things? Because maybe it's not that no. Okay. If you have a question, remember you can stop me. No problem. So uh, what is a symmetrization? As I said, uh, usually symmetrization are merely used as tools, but recently uh, they have been, there is some more theoretical study between, uh, uh, for, for these kind of objects. And uh, so it all starts with simple definitions. So how do we start? Uh, we first need a family of things, of objects, sets, these can be compact sets, measurable sets, even classes of functions. And in that case, symmetrizations are known, maybe for the one of you working in PDs, you know, we are uh, rearrangements of functions uh, and it's the same thing, but to be general, we can fix just a family, a good family. For example, the one you have chosen, compact sets and compact convex sets uh, uh, is a complete metric space with a certain metric. So, this is something where, for example, we can perform limits, which is something we would like to do. Uh, so this is the first thing. We, we need to fix a family of things. Then, always in our end, we need a subspace. Actually, then this procedure will be made for every subspace, but first let's start with one. Uh, and we consider the respective reflection. This, uh, we need this to define what symmetry is. When is an object symmetric? The object will be symmetric when invariant under reflection. And then a symmetrization is quite easily, at this point, this is almost trivial. It's just, this is just a map from our first family to the subfamily of elements which, has, which are invariant under reflections. So this study here, uh, is, it's been started. So the last uh, 20 years were quite active in this direction. 
because many new application of self symmetrization had been found. And uh, then I think this one from 2017 is the first one where symmetrization are, are treated as a theoretic object of its own, if you're interested in it. So let's see some examples. The first one is the, maybe the most known is the Steiner symmetrization. How does this work? Uh, we fix a hyperplane. So the subspace here must be n minus one dimensional. And we consider the orthogonal lines to the, this hyperplane. And we take the sections with our object, the sections will have a measure. And we replace these sections with segments of the same measure, but centered on the hyperplane. For convex bodies, it's, almost, it's even easier because we just take the section and we translate it along the line until it's symmetric with respect to the original subspace H. So this one was the first to be introduced. Uh, and one uh, striking property, this, all, this is almost immediate, thanks to Fubini's theorem, this preserves the volume. Uh, one thing we will see is that this doesn't only preserve the volume, but this decreases the surface. So here starts the idea. Uh, we keep symmetrizing, the volume will remain the same, but the surface will always decrease. And what will happen, we will see next, uh, is just that then we, if we can find a sequence of symmetrizations such that uh, the corresponding objects converge to a ball, then we will have a ball of the same volume of the starting object, but uh, the, sur the surface is smaller. So this is the main argument for this kind of proofs of, the, of, of isoparametric inequalities in general. Another, that the functional alternative is the Schwarz rearrangement, uh, where the uh, instead of considering a hyperplane for the symmetry, we take the vertical direction. So this is one dimensional subspace, and we take the orthogonal section, which basically are just the level sets. We measure the level sets and we replace them with n minus one dimensional balls with the same measure. So we obtain an object which is rotationally symmetric with respect to the vertical axis. In two dimension is the same thing of performing standard symmetrization, but we see even here we are preserving uh, the, the volume of the epigraph. What we will see uh, decreases here, we, we will see, I will just uh, go around it, but what happens here is that this uh, decreases uh, the, the Rayleigh quotient. So it's something related to the gradient and actually this can be generalized uh, uh, and so in this case, this can be used to prove the corresponding functional version of the isoperimetric inequality, which is the Polyazego principle, where what is minimized is the first eigenvalue of uh, the Laplacian. So these are two examples. And uh, now an important thing is that when you start categorizing objects from nothing, then you can see how their properties can uh, sometimes even univocally define them. There are some proof in the article I mentioned before where, where uh, you can uh, just, if you have a symmetrization with certain properties, then it must be exactly the, a specific symmetrization. It's not only general. And we will use them. The la this is uh, the last part I will show you, uh, a part of the proof of, uh, of a work I've done recently. And uh, what is important there is that some properties characterize a whole family of good symmetrization. We will see later what good means. So what properties can be useful? Uh, the first one is surely monotonicity. So we, we would like the symmetrization to preserve the inclusions, which is something, it's reasonable, but this, is, this doesn't always happen, but it's reasonable. Uh, then the impotence, or the impotency depends on the source. Uh, so we want the symmetrization to work just once. If the object is already symmetric, we don't want the symmetrization to make it more symmetric anymore. <clears throat> we have done it. So if we iterate the same symmetrization, the object shouldn't change. This doesn't always happen. All these properties here are not always granted. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, to look at, at combinations of them. But this is, this, are, uh, this is a list of some of them which can be useful. This one, this, the other one is F invariance. So this is just a functional from the family of set to, uh, the, uh, to the real numbers uh, and uh, if, we have a functional which is invariant under symmetrization. We say that the symmetrization is F invariant for that functional. For example, we've seen the volume. The volume is invariant for standard symmetrization. Here I say preferably evaluation, the, the, the measures I've shown you. So 
uh, volume, surface, mean width, even other stuff actually, uh, are valuation in the sense they all respect the inclusion exclusion principle. It's something that you, 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 will, you would like to, uh, to have at your disposal because uh, uh, then you can work with union and intersection of sets, which is actually quite useful. So, uh, and for example, this happens for a lot of symmetrizations. Uh, then another reasonable uh, property is invariance on H symmetric sets. So if the set is already symmetric, I would like the symmetrization not to change it. This, even this is not always granted. So for example, if, if here in Schwarz, for the Schwarz rearrangement, uh, uh, we have that even though, for example, we can take uh, uh, an elliptic paraboloid. So the sections are ellipses. Uh, the sections are already symmetric with respect to the vertical axis, but the symmetrization will change the sections in both of the same measure. So even though the object is already symmetric, Schwarz symmetry, the Schwarz rearrangement changes the object. So for example, this kind of symmetrization doesn't have invariance on each symmetric sets. Uh, the last one is more technical, but it's reasonable because basically this says that if we have an object which is already symmetric, but translated, uh, we want the symmetrization just to eliminate the translation. That's it. This is uh, quite actually. This happens quite often. This is very, but this is very important. But it's, this is just a technical question. Okay. So, what do we want to do with symmetrization? As I said before, at least for isoperimetric inequalities, then we iterate symmetrization. So, in general, uh, when we have a, a sequence of subspaces, we can consider, uh, we can induce a sequence of uh, sets starting for an from an element of the family, and we can induce a sequence of uh, objects, and we can investigate the properties of these sequences. And for example, this is the case of uh, uh, what is done for the isoperimetric inequality. Uh, for the Steiner symmetrization, if we have a certain convex body, we can identify a sequence of hyperplanes depending on the body, such that the corresponding sequence of symmetrizations converges to a ball. So this is almost a proof of isoperimetric inequality because we start from an object, a general convex set or certain measure. We start symmetrizing at every step. If you trust me, the surface decreases, uh, the volume remains the same and the final object is a ball. So you have proved that if we have a certain convex body, then a ball of the same measure we have will have smaller uh, surface. So at this point, it's just a matter of stability, which is quite easily done. Just lower semi-continuity of the surface. This is just technicality. This is not the main topic of this talk, but main idea uh, behind it. So what do we do in general with symmetrizations? So actually, this, uh, this, with these sequences of uh, symmetrization processes, uh, we can prove many geometric inequalities. Bruminkowski, the first one I've showed you. Uh, this is a perimetric inequality, blaschke santalov which is an inequality related to polar uh, bodies. Uh, and this, just with science symmetrization, for example, another symmetrization I will show you in a bit, the Minkowski symmetrization can be used to prove the Urizon inequality, which is a kind of isoperimetric inequality, but for the mean width. And then there is the functional side of it. So uh, we have the inequalities, the Poliasego inequality, I told you before, so an inequality for the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian. Uh, which is minimized when the domain is a ball. And this goes to the faber kahn inequality, basically. So this is an inequality for the Riley quotient. And this doesn't work only for P equal to, but in general, there is, there is a whole book about this uh, uh, kind of approaches to inequalities. This is from Bernstein, Symmetrization and Analysis, uh, where there is a whole chapter about how to prove uh, 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 these inequalities for P norms and things related for P norms. And this thing here, again, using standard symmetrization. But there are other symmetrizations that we are representing a bit based, for example, on the, on the Minkowski addition. Uh, the Minkowski addition is more suitable, for example, uh, for viscosity techniques. Indeed, the, the whole idea behind the viscosity solutions relies uh, uh, into the concept of infant subconvolutions. Uh, if you remember it, infant, infant subconvolutions are just the Minkowski addition of epigraphs. So it's just natural that one can obtain estimates using rearrangements involving the Minkowski addition. And indeed, this is just one work, but many of, of this kind can be found where, and even maybe 
uh, related to other quantities, uh, uh, where th three arrangements one can find these estimates uh, for viscosity solutions. So the range of applications uh, is quite wide. So let's present uh, uh, some of these simulations. This first one, we have, we have seen them, but that they can be explained in general. So we said Steiner symmetrization historically is when the high, the, the, the fixed subspace of symmetry is a hyperplane and we consider the one dimensional sections. But in general, uh, we can uh, fix a subspace and consider the orthogonal sections and we will replace them obviously with the balls of appropriate dimension of the same measure. Again, uh, we will have some kind of uh, rotational inequality, rotational invariance, at least uh, with respect to the hyperplane, of, to, to the surface of uh, uh, symmetry. Uh, we will preserve the volume integrating on the slices, again, using Cubini. And it can be proved that not only the surface, but even the mean width and other things in the middle uh, decrease with uh, this process of symmetrization. So in general, this kind of symmetrization is at this point is uh, it's natural to be considered the, the right one for uh, isoperimetric kinds of inequality. And even today, uh, very recent works uh, are still uh, are still using this the the standard symmetrization to prove different kind of isoperimetric inequality. So the, the the power the geometric power of these objects is still actually uh, quite alive. Then another symmetrization. This one. Haven't, we, have seen, we haven't seen it yet, is the Minkowski symmetrization. This is easier to define because we are just considering uh, the mean of the addition between the set we want to symmetrize and its reflection. So uh, this is sort of an opposite, at least for the volume and all the other things with respect to the Schwarz symmetrization and standard symmetrization, because using the Broom Minkowski inequality, uh, we have that in this increases the volume and actually it increases even the surface and many other things, uh, but it preserves the mean width. This thanks to the property we have seen uh, for the support function. If one, if this is just a direct evaluation, uh, the mean width is preserved by this, uh, in a, that, that, by this symmetrization. So we have Schwarz symmetrization where the volume is preserved but the rest decreases and Minkowski symmetrization where the mean width is preserved and the rest increases. These are sort of, sort of two opposites and this actually is, real in a way that we will see later is even physical uh, in a certain sense. Then there is a third one, which is more technical, even though it has been used for some estimates in PDEs, uh, but for people working with symmetrization, this is more technical. This is more of a test symmetrization, which is an hybrid between uh, uh, the Schwarz symmetrization and the Minkowski symmetrization. So here we work again, on the sections, but instead of replacing them uh, with balls, we replace them with the Minkowski symmetrization of the section. So this starts to become a bit wild. Don't worry if you can't picture it, it's not very easy. Uh, but this is actually, at least in convexity, this it is, it is a very well-known kind of uh, uh, rearrangement uh, introduced during the 90s. Uh, again, using the Broom Minkowski inequality on the section and then integrating on the section, this increases the volume and other things, but this depends. And actually, it seems strange, but when we restrict ourselves to convex sets and the subspace of uh, uh, symmetrization is an hyperplane, then this coincides with Steiner symmetrization. So, this, as I said, this is sort of an hybrid between the two of them. Uh, okay, so at this point, we can try to uh, see this general behavior. So we have seen we, uh, we would like to prove isoperimetric inequalities with these uh, uh, symmetrization processes. So we start looking for good symmetrization processes and also for good sequences of subspaces. And this leads us to definition of universal sequences. So for a certain symmetrization, we will say that a sequence of subspaces is universal if this sequence here. So you can see uh, the uh, the composition of the symmetrizations as a sort of an operator. Uh, we want this operator at the limit always to converge to a ball, no matter what we plug in, and even if we cut an initial part of the sequence. So this is this is this is universal. This seems actually quite difficult to achieve 
uh, the surprising the surprising thing is that it is not at all. Uh, so actually, the first uh, good sequence uh, ever found was exactly of this kind by Steiner. This, this is the sequence that Steiner used to to give his proof, partial proof of the isoperimetric inequality in two dimensions. Obviously, because at the time they only used two and three dimensions. So uh, we have these two directions. And these two directions are such that the angle between them is an irrational multiple of pi. Then if we symmetrize in this way here, so we exchange the symmetrization with respect to the first and the second direction and going on and on, uh, this will always converge to a ball. This is very fun. The, 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 the proof is almost number theory. It's always obviously it's based on this irrationality. Uh, but then this is a this is a universal sequence, for example. Whatever we, we plug in, even if we cut it, uh, this will give us a ball always. And in, in this case, the ball will have the same volume. So this doesn't seem so far fetched as an idea. And this leads to another question. This was investigated during the during the eighties, and then uh, again years later. So we consider a uniform distribution on the sphere. And then we take a sequence of independent and identically distributed directions, and we choose at random a compact set. And we would like to consider the symmetrization process induced by the hyperplanes orthogonal to the direction. So basically, what we are doing is we choose at random uh, the subspaces of symmetrization and the object we want to symmetrize. What happens? What are our, pro what are our probability of success? Uh, what happens here? Uh, the answer is quite surprising. Uh, we will have almost surely convergence to a ball. So if you do it at random, you will finish into a ball. Uh, this has been proved in, in the 80s by Mani Levitska for convex sets, then 2006 by, by Van Schaftigen on uh, compact sets, and recently by Volcic for uh, measurable sets. So this is a quite, this, is, this holds for Steiner symmetrization and Schwarz symmetrization. They are the same sort of, uh, but uh, this holds for all these classes of uh, family, families of, uh, of sets, compact, convex, uh, measurable, they're quite ugly, but this holds every time. But at the same time, it's not that difficult to find counterexamples to this fact. Uh, so consider, for example, this blue square here. If we symmetrize with respect to the vertical or the horizontal direction, it will remain a square. This doesn't go to a ball, and it's not that easy to find, that, uh, that they're difficult to find. Uh, we can symmetrize what I've done here. The, is the Minkowski symmetrization, but this is not the point. If we fix H1, the Minkowski symmetrization will give you the red octagon. And uh, at this point, the direction of symmetries are even more. So we have even more uh, uh, symmetrization processes which will not converge to a ball. So actually, converging to a ball is not that, I mean, it will happen uh, almost every time, but it's not the easy thing to find. And actually, not only this, but there are even counterexamples if we have time at the end, but I don't think we will have time. But if we have time, I will show you a counterexample where uh, a limit doesn't exist, even though the sequence of directions is dense on the sphere. So actually, this thing can become quite wide. Uh, so not only, the, the, so, but this, uh, at least these properties here are for Steiner symmetrization. Uh, but this is actually a common pattern. So it all starts noticing this inclusion here. If we start from the same body and we do the Steiner symmetrization and the Minkowski symmetrization, we have this inclusion here. This is quite easy to prove through the definitions. And this can be used and has been used in 2014 by Coupier and Davidov to prove that universal sequences, the one we have seen before, so the sequences that will always go to balls, uh, they are the same for Steiner symmetrization and Minkowski symmetrizations when we restrict ourselves to hyperplanes. So these good sequences of, of hyperplanes are the same for both the symmetrization, even though they are very different. And this proof is based on this inclusion here and uh, on uh, the inequalities for the volume and uh, all the other things we have seen before. So now we start in the last uh, 13, 15 minutes, uh, I will try to prove uh, result of mine. So first, we need to understand how I wanted to understand how common is that pattern. How far can we go with this kind of concept of generalizing? How how uh, how shared are these kind of properties? So first, 
uh, this is in the work I said at the, be at the beginning. Uh, we can generalize the inclusion here between Steiner and Minkowski symmetrization, uh, just based on the, the properties of the symmetrization we are considering. So a very general symmetrization, however it is made, we just want it to be monotonic, so it respects inclusions, invariance on uh, symmetric sets, and uh, invariant under translation orthogonal to H. So this means the thing that I said, the object is already symmetric, but we just capture the translation. It's just these three power properties. It's the first and the last two I showed you. They doesn't seem so hard to, to achieve. And uh, actually they're not. And we have this chain of inclusion here. And if you look carefully, this includes the inclusion between Steiner and Minkowski symmetrization, because uh, when we, we are in the family of convex uh, compact sets and fiber symmetrization, when H is an hyperplane, is Steiner symmetrization. So actually, this is exactly the inclusion we have seen before, but this is more generalized. So first, this is the first ingredient. A second one is looking to uh, an even uh, more a more general behavior for this sequence of subspaces. So generalizing the concept of universal to what I called stable. So it's almost the same thing as universal, uh, but we don't prescribe the limit. We just want the sequence to converge, including, for example, this counterexample here. This doesn't converge to a ball, but this converges. And again, but this is not all of the cases because there are cases where it doesn't converge. So we are just trying to make it wider, basically. So we call these stable uh, sequences, these sequences that no matter what you plug in and how you cut it at the beginning, the, the sequence you obtain will always have a limit. You don't know what the limit is, but this will always have a limit. A limit. This generalizes, obviously, universal sequences because universal sequences, through this definition, are even stable. So uh, I take this whole family of uh, symmetrization, which are the ones uh, considered in this theorem for this inclusion. This inclusion here is the, is the key at this point. Uh, I take this whole family of symmetrization, so on convex set, convex compact sets, so monotonic, invariant for orthogonal translation, and on symmetric sets. And then what, what I've been able to prove is that if we take two symmetrization, two symmetrizations in this, in this family, a sequence of subspaces is stable for one of them if and only if it is stable for the other one. So this whole family of symmetrizations, they all have the same behavior when it goes to convergence. Basically, this is the idea. And obviously, this can be refined even to universality. So even the ones who converge to balls are all the same. This is just a matter of those three properties I showed you before. So this generalizes the results of Kofi and Davidov and uh, tells us that this family behaves all in, in the same way. So how do we prove this? I, this is, will be the last 10 minutes, I suppose, and I will uh, I, I will just show you a piece of the proof just to let you give you a glimpse of the techniques that can be used. This is, as I said, this is not difficult, but it's a bit of, it's a bit exotic, as you one, as one would say. These are not techniques usually uh, famous, at least. So first, uh, the first thing is noticing that these all, the, the inequalities we have seen for Steiner and Minkowski symmetrizations uh, actually, uh, are, a concept, are a specific case or a more gen of a more generic uh, um, kind of inequalities, uh, which hold for the whole family of symmetrizations here. So the volume increases for symmetrization, and the mean width decreases. The limit case being for the volume style symmetrization, for the mean width Minkowski symmetrization. So the proof is actually quite easy. Uh, so first, it's the inclusion. This follows from the theorem uh, from the previous slide. So the volume here is bigger. And then we, have, we said that fiber symmetrization increases the volume thanks to integration on the section and the Minkowski inequality. So this is immediate. The second one, uh, there are many ways to prove this, but basically they include, as I said, convexity is, is a very strong uh, uh, structure property. If we have two convex sets and they're included one into the other, then we have even uh, this duality for support function, one is bigger than the other. So then you make the, the, the width, the average of the width. So even the mean width is monotonic as the volume. It's the same thing. So uh, be, since uh, the uh, 
this, this general symmetrized object is included in the Minkowski symmetral of the same object, then we have this, this inequality, and then we have the equality from the, from the, from, from the limit case of uh, the Minkowski symmetrization. So we have this kind of inequality, uh, which generalizes the ones we have seen uh, for uh, Steiner and Minkowski symmetrization. Then this is the main idea. So first one, so since Minkowski symmetrization is at the top of the chain, we take a symmetrization in the middle and we prove that if a sequence is stable for this symmetrization, then this implies stability for Minkowski symmetrization. And this will be the step I will show you. Uh, the other step is the converse one. So if we know that a symmetrization is stable on the top, then the stability goes down the chain of inclusion. So uh, I will prove just the first implication here. Uh, and uh, I will use another notion, which I haven't introduced before, which is the Nicodym distance, which is just, this is a distance on com convex compact bodies. So uh, we are restricting ourselves now, even though it's possible to do a more general thing, we're restricting ourselves to compact convex bodies. So compact convex sets with positive measure. Then, this Nicodym distance here, the, the, the volume of the symmetric difference is a, a distance equivalent to the Hausdorff distance. So the basic idea is that if two objects are different, the distance is positive. And so the, the Nicodym distance obviously is positive and we will try to find a contradiction on this volume of the symmetric distance. So first of all, we consider a subspace as in the hypothesis, a sequence of subspaces as in the hypothesis, which is stable to this general symmetrization, which is in the middle. We don't know where it is. And we suppose by contradiction that this sequence of hyperplanes uh, doesn't, remain, doesn't remain stable for uh, uh, Minkowski symmetrization. This means that there exists a set, convex compact sets, such that the corresponding sequence of symmetrization doesn't converge. So we have at least two different limits. We call them L and J. Uh, and our point here will be to prove that actually they are the same thing. This, this is the idea. An important thing to notice is that even though we are, uh, by contradiction, we are supposing that the limits are different, the volume here, we said in the first, in the lemma I proved before, that the volume is increasing. And the volume is, is, is even bounded because we can see ourselves in a very big ball that doesn't change uh, with symmetrization. So the volume of the object will always remain. Uh, less or equal than the volume of this ball. And uh, then the sequence of the volumes, even uh, if the sets are different, the sequence of the volume is uh, bounded and monotonically increasing. So the volume, the limit exists, it's just one. So these two sets, L and J, even, they are diff even though they are different, they might be different, but the volume must be the same. So we find a step of the symmetrization where we are arbitrarily closed to the final volume, uh, let's say this index i, and we, we fix this epsilon as, as small as we want. Then the trick is the following. So we are at the step i, so we are, the volume is arbitrarily close. There is a, okay, bye Marco. Uh, the volume is arbitrarily close to uh, the final volume, and now, we, sp we consider two sequences. On the right-hand side, we are going on with the Minkowski symmetrization, where we, where we suppose by contradiction, the limit doesn't exist. On the left-hand side, we proceed with the symmetrization where we know the limit exists because the sequence of subspaces is stable. So we know that this limit, we, we, we cut an initial part of it, but we start from a convex set and we had on the hypothesis that the sequence of subspaces is stable. So we can cut it, we can, we can put whatever object we want, but the limit must exist. So the sequence of the left, uh, left hand side converges. The one on the right hand side, we don't know if it converges. Uh, still, uh, thanks to the monotonicity. So if, uh, if we consider ourselves at the step i, and then we do the symmetrization through Minkowski symmetrization or the other one, we will have inclusion thanks to the theorem I, I showed you before. So we have this limit for the sequence of, on the left-hand side, and we have two limits at least for the sequence on the right-hand side. This was the hypothesis by contradiction. And thanks to the monotonicity, this limit here must be included in both 
j and l. So at this point, we just go estimating uh, the distance between j and l. So they are different. So this distance should be strictly positive. Uh, we, we write it explicitly. So this is the sum of the volume of j minus l and the volume of l minus j. Uh, since v is included in both j and l, if we replace it with both j and l, we obtain this inequality here because we are subtracting less stuff. So this, vo this volume of this difference here are bigger. Moreover, V is strictly included in J and L. So the volume of J minus D is the volume of J minus the volume of D and the same things applies here. So actually here we have two twice the volume of C minus the volume of D. Now the volume of D will be bigger than the volume of Ki, which was at this step here the one for what for which we fight we fix the epsilon so at this point we will have that the distance between j and l is arbitrarily small but the two sets should be separated so this is the contradiction and if this proves that if a symmetrization if a sequence of subspaces is stable for a certain symmetrization in the middle of the chain of inclusion then this stability goes to the top to the minkowski symmetrization the rest is uh, the same, uh, the, the argument is identical. One just uses uh, the mean width, so it's a bit more technical, but the ideas are the same. And I think I have the counter example, but if you want, I can stop here. So just skip to the end. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Jacopo. Any questions? Yes, I have a few questions. Tell me. So um, the first thing is uh, you always talk about convergence 